convict us of our sins and transform us by your divine power. For we pray today in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. John the Baptist was sent by God. He was sent by God to be a witness. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. When you are sent by God, he orchestrates your steps. You know who you are when you are sent by God. This man was sent to be a witness and to witness of the light that was come to the world and that through him the world might believe. He was not the light, reading from John chapter 7 verse 8. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was a true light which gives light to every man coming in to the world. John, everything about him was special. His conception was special. The instructions given by Gabriel the angel to his father was special. He had the vow of the Nazarene, he was special. There were certain things he couldn't do because he was special. The word says that John was full of the Holy Spirit. Because John was sent to do a special work. And John was empowered by God to do that work. John's ministry was in the wilderness. John's clothing was that similar to the prophet Elijah. He wore clo coarse clothing and he wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. John didn't go to the synagogues or churches to preach. John's cathedral was in the wilderness. But when he preached the word of God, people came from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west to hear the word of God. John had this kind of power about him that when he opened his mouth, the word convicted the heart. John had this kind of power about him that when he entered a room, if there were sinners in the room, they would look and behold that he was a holy man of God. And they would be convicted to repent of their sins. John was no ordinary man. He didn't wear the finery of the Levites, the priests, and the scribes. But oh, when he opened his mouth and declared, Everyone were compelled, each and every person was compelled to hear the word of God. So impactful was his ministry that he began to empty the churches. He began to empty the synagogues. And so the people now begin to question the leaders of the church. Who is this man and who gives him authority? So they sent a group from Jerusalem to go into the wilderness and they began to question John the Baptist. They asked him, are you the Christ? He said, no, I am not the Christ. They asked him, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not Elijah. Then they said, give us an answer. What you do and what you are saying about yourself, who are you? John's answer was, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. You see, when a king was coming into a town, the king would send messengers ahead of him. Because when a king is coming, you've got to prepare the roadway for the king. You've got to put banners up because a king is coming and he's no 
ordinary man. So John was sent because the true king, the king of kings and the Lord of Lord was coming. He was coming to earth to redeem mankind. So John says, no, I'm not the Christ. No, I'm not Elisha. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now I, when I looked at this, I said, my mind, John is answering and he's telling them what I am not. You see, when you are a witness for God, you have to know who you are in Christ. I want us to remember that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his special people, that we may proclaim the gospel of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. No, I'm not Jesus. No, I'm not Elijah. I am the voice of one declaring the way of the Lord. You've got to know who you are in Jesus because God has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And because you've been called out of darkness, there's some places you cannot go. There are some words that must not come from your lips. There are some positions you can't afford to place yourselves in. There are certain kind of clothing you cannot put on yourself because you are a child of God. You're special. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. And God has given us power and authority to live the consecrated life and to declare his truth to the people of God. John the Baptist was a powerful witness for God. So when we read the text in Luke chapter seven, verse 18 to 23, it sorts of confuses me. Because when I can imagine Peter denying Christ, I can't imagine John denying Jesus or questioning who Jesus is. Because I remember when he was in Elizabeth's womb, when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, when the child that was prophesied that would come, when Jesus comes in close proximity to John in the amniotic fluid in his mother's belly, the Bible says that John leaped in his mother's womb because even from the womb, John knows who he is and John is able to bear witness of who Jesus is. So I can't understand when I read Luke chapter seven, verse 18 to 23, it causes me to wonder now, John, what is going on in your mind? Let's look at verse 18. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. You see, John and Jesus, John was such a powerful preacher. He did his work so well that people began to believe that this was the promised Messiah. The people who John preached to, the ones who heard the words and came for the joy of salvation, they were not of the aristocrats. They were not of the Jewish leadership. The people who came and repented and were baptized were the poor, the people who were suffering, the people who knew they needed Jesus. They are the ones that came to John the Baptist. And now we have Jesus now on the, on the path. Jesus now is declaring the truth about his father's kingdom. And the aristocrats don't want to know or hear what Jesus is saying. The church people will not accept him. So the people that come to Jesus are the poor. The disenfranchised, the broken hearted, the cast down and the downtrodden. They are the ones 
those who come to Jesus. But the problem is, this is the same crowd that used to go to John. So now John's crowd is shifting to Jesus. So the disciples realize that there is a shift. And the disciples of John are becoming jealous. They're becoming envious because John is losing ground. But Jesus is being established. And it was in accordance to the word of God because John says, He must increase and I must decrease. John has decreased so much that John is now inside Herod's prison. And the disciples come and they give a report. And this is the report that they gave. It was an accurate report. It was a factual report because Jesus was doing some really amazing things. But in the midst of the report, they put some things in the report that caused John to doubt. John, we don't understand. How is it that Jesus has not come to see you? You of all people, you were so faithful. John, you spoke the truth to whomever would listen. You spoke the truth to the politician. You spoke justice and righteousness to the people of God and you spoke it publicly and you spoke it loudly. You never compromised your faith. You have held up the banner of Prince Emmanuel. You would think that Jesus would remember about you. When you read Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, the words of the disciples placed in John doubt in his mind. Poor Johnny was in prison, yes. He was suffering, yes. But he was not denying the power that was in Jesus. Not until the disciples came. You see, the devil was at work. Because a witness is someone who has seen or experienced an event. John says, I come to bear witness about the light. He uses a courtroom terminology because he's saying, I'm on the witness stand and I'm here to declare what I've seen and what I have heard about Jesus. And then you have the expert witness. The expert witness looks at all the facts and then gives an opinion. John says to the people, such a one is among you. The light is among you, yet you do not see him. But I want you to know this Messiah is so powerful, so anointed, that I am not even worthy to loose his sandals. I'm not worthy. That kind of role is for a servant. That kind of role is for a foreigner. No Jew would lose a sandal. But John says, listen, even if Jesus gave me an opportunity to lose his sandals, this Messiah is so holy that I'm not even worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. His witness, his testimony was well established. While on the Jordan River, while baptizing and proclaiming the word of God, John sees Jesus coming. John chapter 1 and verse 29, he sees Jesus coming. And then White said he didn't know Jesus personally. But when he looked, he saw the holiness of God. John looks and he says, behold the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. This text is one of my favorite texts because when I was a teenager, I was searching for God. Wasn't born an Adventist, wasn't even born a Christian. But as I was maturing and developing in life, I began to yearn and seek after God. I began to say there must be a God and so I began to, 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 to investigate different religions. I researched about Hinduism. I re 
searched about Islam and Islam caught my attention because Islam was so disciplined. So on Sundays I began to attend the Sunday meetings and they told me that I could become a Muslim, I just need to take my Shahada. I need to swear allegiance to Muhammad the prophet. And so one Sunday I went and the preacher, the, the, the proclaimer said that Muhammad is the Lamb of God. So when he said that, I said, if Muhammad is the Lamb of God, why is it that there is no peace in my heart? So as I was walking home from the meeting, I began to talk to God. I said, God, if you exist, I want you to show me who is the Lamb of God. I went home and in my house there was an old dusty Bible. It was there and it was sealed shut by the dust and debris because no one used it. But I opened the Bible randomly to the book of John and when I opened the Bible the word said that John was at the Jordan River baptizing and when he saw Jesus coming he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's when I began to understand who Jesus is. You see, John could have said he covers sin. But John says he takes sin away. When Jesus takes your sin and says you're forgiven, it means that you are forgiven. When Jesus cleanses you of your sins, it means that you are totally cleansed. Oh, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John hears this report. And John says to two of his disciples, go back to Jesus. Ask Jesus, are you the one to come? Or should we look for another? What a question. It would have been okay if someone else asked this question. But John's whole purpose of being alive is to testify and give witness of the Christ. But now we find John sending the disciples, go ask Jesus. Are you the one that should come? Or should we expect another what a question but you have to understand John's situation John is in Herod's prison he is inside of a cell that is inside of a larger cell he's in a cell and the cell is dark John cannot tell if it's day or night John is isolated. John doesn't have a scroll to read. John is isolated in a cell inside of a cell. The only thing John can hear are the torment, the, 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 the prisoners who are being tormented. He can hear them weeping and crying. That's all John could hear. I want you to understand that John is not used to that kind of a lifestyle. John is from the wilderness. John comes and goes as he likes. When John lies down, the sky is his canopy. John is used to being free. But now we find John inside of a cell, inside of another cell. And John has now been planted with the seeds of doubt. You've got to be careful who you listen to. You've got to be careful who you take counsel from. Because some people are mercenaries for the devil. Some individuals, they stand in the work of progress. Oh, you know who they are. When the pastor says, let's have a crusade. These people say, now is not the time. We don't have enough money to declare the word of God. When you call for a prayer meeting, no one is at prayer meeting.
routine. When you call for prayer and you say, pray for me, you can't even believe when people say, I'll pray for you. What has become of the house of the living God? What has become of the people of God? This is the place of hope. This is the place in which we present Jesus to the world. This is the place when people come, they can experience healing. This is the place that when people come, the preachers lift up the word and declare, thus saith the Lord. What has become? What has happened to the people of God? I wish that the people of God would just wake up this morning. I wish the people of God would just say in their hearts, enough is enough in God. I've wasted enough of the time of the Lord. I've wasted too much time. It's time for me now to seek the Lord with all my heart and with all my mind. Are you the one or should we expect another? John was at a low point in his life. And when you're at a low point in your life, it's easy for the enemy to come in. Now the enemy is happy because the people of God are at a low point. Right now demons are laughing at us because the people of God have no power in them. Right now the enemy is exalted because the people of God don't know how to read their Bible. The people of God no longer pray. The people of God no longer worship God as they should. Are you the one that should come or should we expect another? So the disciples of Jesus, they go to pursue him. And they don't talk to Jesus when he's alone. Oh no. They wait till Jesus is teaching a multitude. And then they stop him and they say, listen, we have a question from John the Baptist. John the Baptist wants to know, are you the one? That is to come or should we expect another? When you read the Zion of Ages, you will discover that something extraordinary happens to Jesus. When Jesus hears that question, a power comes over him like never before. He's energized because Jesus knows that this is a question that questions his divinity. Are you the one or should we expect another? And it's coming from the one that should declare with all authority that he is the one. So Jesus looks at them and Jesus says to them, follow me. Look what I'm doing and what you see me do, go tell John. Look at me, I'm curing infirmities. Look at me, I'm clearing afflictions. Look at me, I'm casting out evil spirits. Look at me because many who are blind now have sight. Look at me because I am doing the works of my father. I love this answer. Jesus could not have given a better answer. What Jesus did was he quoted from Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 61 and verse one it says, because the Lord has anointed me. Verse one, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are in bounds to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What Jesus did was he gave John the word. He says, go tell John what you see. Go tell John the blind receive sight. Go tell John that those who 
are sick are healed. Go tell John that the lepers receive their healing. Go tell John that the dead are raised from the dead. God, my, my Savior, gives John the word of God. And then when the disciples leave now to go to Jesus, he turns to the multitude and he begins to speak of John as the greatest prophet that ever lived. He said, what did you expect to see? A reed shaken in the wind. Behold, John is the greatest prophet that ever lived. But Jesus does not declare those words in the ears of the disciples. He allows them to take to John the word. When they go to John in Herod's cell and they tell John what Jesus is doing, John realizes that what Jesus is doing is he's fulfilling the word of God. So John in a dark prison gets the word. John in his loneliness gets the word. John who is about to be beheaded gets the word. John who had doubt in his heart gets the word. And when John gets the word, John holds on to the word and the word is sufficient for John. The word is enough to keep John. The word is enough to constrain John. The word is enough to comfort John. The word is enough to liberate John. The word is enough to set John free. For who the son of God sets free is free indeed. The word is enough because the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word is enough because thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. The word of God is enough to take me through my trouble. So when I look at the church and the church appears to be sleeping, and I look at the holy men of God and the holy women of God who seem to be at rest. I open the word and the word says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And I say unto you, Peter, on this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So when I look and I see prayer meeting is empty, I remember what Jesus says. On this rock, I build my church. I remember when Jesus says, Peter, you're not the rock. Because Peter, you're just a pebble. Somebody can pick you up and throw you away. You're movable. But Peter, on this rock, I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is saying, Peter, listen to me. Don't watch the crowd. My people, John chapter 10, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep, they know my voice. And when I speak, they will listen. Don't watch the crowd. Watch Jesus. Because when you watch Jesus, you cannot go wrong. When you follow Jesus, you cannot go wrong. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of will grow in the light of his glory. In the light of his glory. In the light of his glory. If you just cast your eyes upon Jesus, he is sufficient to carry you. If you just do what Jesus says and trust in his word, he has the power to sustain you. When John the Baptist hears the word, the word of God sustains him. And the last day church, must hear the word of God to sustain them. John Matthew 28 verse 19. He says, go ye out into the world. And he says that we must teach 
that we must preach, that we must baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the sweet Holy Spirit. We are the witnesses of God. And we witness of his power by how we live our lives. We witness to him by how we treat others. We witness for him by how we love and how we forgive. I tell you, when I look in the word, it comforts me. I remember when I gave my life to Jesus. I could not even read the Bible. When I opened the Bible to read it, I could not understand. Could not understand the King James Version of the Bible. When I read, read the Bible, I would go to church and I would ask God to send someone to explain what the Bible means. And I would come in contact with people and they would go straight to the word of God and tell me exactly what the word means. We behave as though we are not serving a powerful God. And no matter how simple the request, God's answer is yes, wait, or I have better for you. His desire is to give to the children, his children, the desires of their heart. So I asked God to teach me his word. And then I asked God, help me to be a witness for you. Because it's easy to stand here and preach, but it's very difficult to tell somebody about Jesus. So I asked the Lord to help me to teach the Bible. Help me to lead individuals to Christ. And so I became a Bible worker. I remember when I applied to the conference for a job. Nice resume. Bachelor's degree. Master's degree from Oakwood University. Years of service as working for the general conference as a missionary. Sent in the resume after 40 days of prayer and fasting. Sent in the resume to the president of the conference. And the only answer I got was, we have Bible work. I turned to my husband and I said, all my sacrifice, all that I have done in obedience to God, and all I can be is a Bible worker. My husband looked at me and he said, what's wrong with that? If God had called you to be a president, would you be happy? I said, yes. If he had called you to be a secretary of the conference, would that make you happy? I said, yes. He said, well, God has called you to win souls for Jesus. I said, okay, okay. I'm going to go and win souls. But all the theological training that I did didn't prepare me for that kind of work. First day on the job in Spanish town, I showed up in a suit. After one hour, I looked for the nearest shop open. I went to the shop and I said, listen, sell me a bag juice. And make sure it has plenty of ice. The heat almost killed me. But when I began to pray, and I say, God, put the souls in my hand. Put the souls in my hand. I started going into homes and declaring the word of God, and people would just surrender. I remember going into this house in New York to give Bible study to a lady. And while giving the Bible study, God said to me, Ask her about the promise. I'm doing the Bible study and I'm talking to God. I say, God, you want me to ask the woman about the promise? She's going to think I'm crazy. So I'm doing the Bible study, but the spirit of God is troubling me. So I say to her, the Lord told me to ask you about the promise. Her jaw dropped open. She said, how do you know about the promise? I said, God told me to ask you about the promise. 
She said, when I was in Jamaica, I made a promise to God that if he took me to the United States to live, and if he brought all my family, my husband and my children, that I would serve him. She said to me, it's interesting you ask me that. Because my husband and children after years will be coming to America tomorrow. And I'm supposed to pick them up from the airport. I said to her, God has sent me as his servant to tell you, remember the promise. Remember the promise. It's time to cash in on the promise. I remember studying with a man, studying with him, and the man received every word I said. And then I made an appointment to come now and to ask him about baptism. When I got to his apartment, when I knocked on the door, this man who always opened the door, when he opened the door, it was another woman waiting for me when i went into the apartment she said sit down i sat down she said you plan to baptize my father I said yes she said well i go to the jesus only church and we only baptize in jesus name i said god what am i gonna say now so i said god give me an answer because when you're God's witness, he promises to give you an answer. I said to her, well, I go to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we go by what the Bible says. And the Bible says in Matthew 28 and verse 19, that we must go, we must teach, and we must baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the sweet Holy Spirit, the woman got mad. She said, pick up your books, pick up your Bible and get out of my house. So I picked up my things and I got out of her house. I left her house. And when I was walking, the Lord said, go in a couple of days, go in a few days. About three days later, I went back to the house. The apartment has a sign on it, vacant. I look, no curtains are there. No furniture are there. The man is gone. And I returned to Jamaica. Never forgot about him. Two years later, pastor from Breath of Life Ministry, Carlton Bird, invited me to do Bible work in the same city. So when I got to the city, I said, God, I have unfinished business here. I was studying the Bible with a man and he disappeared. I want you to show me the man. Reveal the man to me. I said, I know this is a big city, but I serve a big God. Yeah. And if you can, you can, if you want to, you can show him to me. I'm driving in the vehicle. And the Holy Spirit arrests my attention. The Holy Spirit turns my head to an apartment complex. Holy Spirit says, go inside that building. I go into the building and there is a list of the residents in the building. I begin to look for his name, Michael Armagon. And I look, I find the name Michael Armagon. I pick up the phone and I call the apartment number. And when he answered the phone, he said, hello. I said, I'm that woman from Jamaica who God sent me here two years ago to tell you about the love of Jesus. I'm that woman and he said, Latoya, is that you? I've searched all over to find you. When I go to the store, I look for you. When I'm walking on the street, I look for you. I ask God to bring you back into my life. This man invites me upstairs to his apartment. When I go inside his apartment, he says to me, 
My daughter did not want me to be baptized in the Adventist church. So she moved me away late one evening and put me in this apartment. And from she's put me here, I hardly see her. But I've been praying that God would send you to me. And here you are, how did you find me? I said to him, all I did was say, God, show me the map. And God showed me the map. I finished my Bible lesson. And the next Sabbath, he was in church. And when he was baptized and he came out of the water, he said to me, you don't know this, but years ago I prayed. And I said, God, I want to join your church. And years later, God has answered my prayer. Amen. Like John, we are a witness. And God is depending on us to not lose heart. Yes, we're in a dark cell, but don't lose hope. Jesus is coming. And when he says he's going to do something, he means it. Working in Spanish town and doing Bible work in the hot sun. Hot sun. Knocking on doors, people don't want to hear about Jesus. I say, God, you sent me here to win souls. Give me some souls to win. Went to the crusade and a lady came to me. She said, I don't know what it is, but God say I must give you this name and number. So she gave me a name and number. When I got home, I called the man. The man said, speak quickly because I leave my house early in the morning. I said to him, what time do you leave? He said, seven o'clock. I said to him, I will come at 6.30. I wanna talk to you. The man said, come and don't be late. So I got my Bible and I went to this man's house. Went in the garage, talking about your life a witness for Jesus. Went into the garage. When I got in the garage, the man's whole family was there. Wife, children, mother-in-law, everyone was there. Sat down with the man and the man said, listen, I'm not a bad man. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't go to parties. I work hard and I take care of my family. I'm not a bad man. So I opened the Bible and I started to tell him that all of us are bad men and women because of sin. And I opened to him the plan of salvation. And while I was talking, I could hear the wife, I could hear her moaning. And the man said to me, listen, my family, they are Adventists. Every morning I hear them praying. Every evening I hear them praying. To talk about witness. I hear them calling my name in prayer. I don't know what it is that's in the way of me giving my life to God. Because it's not like the world has anything to offer me. So I said to him, I know what is in the way. Lord has shown me what is in the way. I said to him, you are in the way. We're going to pray now and we're going to ask God to move you out of the way. And I'm not going to pray, you are going to pray. The man begins to pray one of the most beautiful prayers I've ever heard. The man begins to pray and he says, God, Maybe you don't know me. My name is John. And I've heard about you many times. My family have been praying for me. And for some reason I can't move. He says, Jesus, move me out the way. Move me out the way. And then he said, Amen. Amen. Next morning I went to study with him. Studied with him three times. This is the third time. When I go again, the whole family 
are seated in the garage. I begin the study and he says, before you begin, I have something to tell you. But in my mind, I'm thinking he's going to say, I'm not interested. So I say to him, before you answer, before you say something, let me pray. So I pray. He says, I have something to tell you. I said, let me do the Bible study first. So I do the Bible study. He says, let me tell you something. I said, before you say something, let me tell you what Jesus has done for you. He says, listen, I have something to tell you. He says, God has moved me out the way. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I said, the baptism is in two days. He said, I will be ready. Day of the baptism. I see him under the tent. And I'm watching him. And when they make the appeal, he gets from under the tent and starts to go to his car. So I go to the car and I said, is everything okay? He said, yes, I'm just getting my baptismal bag. Man went and lined up with the candidates, raised his hand and said yes to all the vows. And when he went in the water and was baptized, I saw the mother crying, the wife crying, the children crying, and I saw the man surrender his life to Jesus. I have never seen him again. Because after that night, I was reassigned to another meeting. I want you to know that we are God's witnesses. And all of us must tell the world about Jesus. He's coming, he's coming, he says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. Jesus is coming whether we're ready or not. Jesus is coming and all Jesus wants us to do is light up the world. Tell the world Jesus is coming. Tell people that are dying in sin that there is hope in Jesus. Tell people, tell them, tell them though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be as white. Tell them, tell them that I died to save them. Tell the world, tell the world that Jesus, this same Jesus who you see going up in like manner shall return. Tell them, tell them that Jesus is coming soon. Be my witness, be my witness. Do not keep silent. Do not shut your mouth. Do not say, what can I do for Jesus? No, say, Jesus, here I am, send me. This program was brought to you by the Maypen Seventh-day Adventist Church. You may find more at Maypen SDA at youtube.com or by following us on Facebook at Maypen SDA Church. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.